know, life could be a raging sea, and life can be a terrible storm. But the question we always ask ourselves is, who's the anchor of our life? We know storms will come, just as New Edition sang back in the days. <laughs> you guys know that song? Storms will come. But this we know for sure, can you stand the rain? But it's an important question to ask ourselves, who's the anchor of our lives? Who do we depend on? Who do we rely on through the tough times, through the situations of life? Who grounds us? Who solidifies us? Who is our foundation? Let me ask you a question this morning. What does it mean to truly know someone? You ever thought about that? What does it mean when you truly know someone? Because you can know of someone... You could be acquainted with someone, but what does it mean to truly know someone? Is it through experiences that you've been together? Is it through years of relationship? Or is it even deeper than that? You know what knowing someone truly means? Like, I really know that person. It all starts with a commitment. When you have a friend... They're truly your friend because both of you committed to one another to be loyal friends to one another. As husband and wife, when you took those vows, you made a commitment to be there for one another, to truly know that person. It's about setting your heart and your love upon someone. Say, setting your heart. Setting your love. Say, setting your love, setting your love. upon someone. It's about making that commitment. It's about a bond with someone else to be faithful, to be truthful, to endure even when it's challenging. That's what it truly means to truly know someone. Because sometimes you might bump into people and say, hey, you ever have a, a, a coworker or a friend and you have a mutual acquaintance or mutual friend, they're like, wait, you know that guy? Yeah, how do you know him? Oh, I know him back in the days from school. Oh, I know him because he's my cousin. And you're like, oh, it's a small world, right? A lot of times you, you bump into people and you realize. It's funny when uh, I go places and then someone comes up to me and says, hey, Pastor, uh, I want to introduce you to, uh, to my friend. And then I'm like, hey, wait, you know this guy? <laughs> so, like, a lot of times you don't have to introduce you. You're like, I, I know this guy. How do you know this guy? Oh, back in the days we used to be, or whatever it may be. It's funny because... You can know of people, but a lot of times acquaintances is not truly knowing somebody, right? Knowing someone is deeper than that. Three, three weeks ago, we started a new and original series from the very heart of God to you, and we entitled it, God's Got This. Say, God's Got This. And in part one, if you remember, we discovered that assurance in life is only found in God. We remember that God protects us like a loving and powerful mother eagle who protects her chicks with her mighty wings. I always picture it as like an eagle. Eagles are majestic and powerful. Now, I said you would be crazy to try to reach into that nest to pull one of those eggs or one of those chicks because the mom, the mother eagle will, will attack you, right, with that, that powerful beak. And then it also talked about how God also protects us like a shield, and a buckler. We talked about how like, it's like God has shielded you like Iron Man. And not only shielded you like Iron Man, but he also gave you Captain America's shield. So you're shielded twice. You're shielded by his love and you're shielded by his grace and you're shielded by his hand. So you're protected in that way and assured us that God is our protector. In part two, we discovered further that God assures us that he protects us and charges legions of angels over you. I talked about how, you know, I'm not someone who's all into this sensationalism and things like that. But one thing I know is scripture tells us that angels were charged to cover you. Like right now where you're at, there's angels surrounding you. When you wherever you go to work, to school, there's angels surrounding you. God specifically commissioned them to be around you. And we know angels are powerful, powerful beings. But he didn't just send one, which would have been comforting. But he sent a legion. You're rolling around with an entourage of angels, amen? And you have to always declare that and understand that God has his hand upon you and he protects you. And then we finished off with 
being encouraged that God overcomes the enemy in our lives. And we talked about two scary things in Scripture in Psalms 91. It talked about a young hungry lion, and it talked about a king cobra. It was funny because two of the animals that I would not want to be in the presence of without a, a cage, like at the zoo, I'm glad that there's barriers there. But if there was two animals that would not want to be next to is one, a lion, a young hungry lion, okay, a young hungry lion. Not the, not the king of the jungle who's just chilling because he knows he got it, but it's those young hungry lions that are fighting for a position that are hungry, they're ravenous, they, they, they want to kill, they want to hunt. That, I don't want to be in front of a young hungry lion. And second, I would not want to be in the presence of a king cobra, right? Those things are just, the head is massive. I'm like, no, I don't want to be in the presence of a cobra or a lion. But it's funny because the psalmist talks about that. I'm like, those are the two things that I would not want to be in front of, you know? I'm, I'm, this guy's just, he's just like me. He's just probably watched Discovery Channel. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But the psalmist says, even when you're facing the enemy, that is like a young hungry lion. Even when you're facing an enemy like a, a mighty cobra, God is the lion of Judah who defeats any young hungry lion. And God is the one who crushed the head of the serpent at Calvary on the cross. So you can be reassured that our God is in control. Amen. Someone give him praise in the house of God. And for our finale of this series, God's got this. The psalmist finishes off with the last three verses, verse 14 to 16 with a powerful promise for those who set their love upon him, for those who set their heart upon him. We're going to read from Psalm 91, verse 14 to 16. And if you could please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Psalm 91, verse 14 to 16. Say, God's got this. All right, let's read from verse 14. Ready? One, two, three. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we honor you today, and we are so excited to finish off this series of God's Got This in Psalm 91. And we're also excited, God, to celebrate for those mothers and motherly figures that are in our lives, oh God. We just pray that you just move in a mighty way in this service, and we thank you for the opportunity to receive your powerful, life-changing word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. You may be seated. All right, so let's start with verse 14 this morning. It says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. These last three verses are set in the first person of God. Okay? It's God speaking to us the promise and blessing over his people. And he speaks specifically over those who set their love upon him. Say that again. Say, set their love Upon him. So for those that set their love upon him, he's specifically speaking to you. First person. This psalm right here, these last three verses, is strictly from him to you, directly to you. And it's been a wonderfully noted last word of psalms because it's to his people. Now, what does it mean to set one's love upon someone else? To set one's love. What it means is that God means to do it by choice. Say choice. Love is a, a choice. You choose to love. Amen. And in the negative way, at the same, same time, you can also choose to hate, which we won't, don't recommend as believers because we are filled with God's love. But it's your choice to love someone. And because of that, we know that setting your love upon someone is making a, a choice to do that. It's being intentional to setting your love. Let me give you an example. For married couples, look at this picture of this couple so busy, right? So busy trying to get through their day. And sometimes you could even be together, but sometimes you're not even together. You know what I'm saying? You could be in the same room. You could be sitting on the same couch. You could be sitting in the same car. But it doesn't mean that you're actually together. 
Sometimes you're so divided. Maybe you guys are looking at your phone all day. You know, sometimes you'll look at, go in the restaurants and you see couples, both of them are not even talking to each other. They're just looking at their phones. They're there, but they're not there. And it's important as believers that when we make that intentional effort to set our love upon God, that we're there. That when we're at church, we're there. We're there with him. Amen. So married couples, just as married couples have to schedule time together, make dates, make an effort, you got to plan something. And men, don't always be the one to wait for your wife to plan something. Why don't you plan something? Right? Why do we always say, oh, whatever you want to do. This is this man. They're watching the game. Whatever you want to do. Whatever. How about we do this? No, I don't want to do that. But whatever you want to do, honey. How about we do this? Nah, I don't want to do that. But whatever you want to do, honey. Today, especially, you can practice this. Husbands, do something that your wife wants to do. Even if you don't like doing it, it's their day today. Amen? And make that a practice and make that a habit of doing something they want to do. Even though it's hard. Sometimes, you know, even I'm preaching to myself. Even though it's hard, you say, God, help me to reach out and sacrifice for my wife. Can I get an amen? All the moms better say amen. All the wives better say amen. I'm helping you out right here. <laughs> you can uh, nudge your husband or spouse. But to set one's love upon God means that we don't wait for the feeling of love to come, but we simply choose to think and act towards God, even if we don't feel love yet. Because I tell you, in James, it says, if you draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. Love is not always an emotion. Love is action. And there's going to be times where you don't love your spouse. There's going to be times where you don't even love your best friend at that moment. Maybe they said something that hurt, like that it was correct, but it hurt. Why would you say that? I'm offended. And at that very moment, you're like, I don't love you right now, right? Even with spouses, you love them, but at those moments, you don't love them. But see, love is a choice. Love is an action. It's not always uh, unicorns and rainbows and butterflies. There's times where love is challenging. Sometimes love is hard, right? But to set one's love upon God means that even before we feel the feeling to come or not, we simply choose to act towards God in worship and in adoration. Because I tell you, the moment that you do then you start to feel his love flood through. Even in those mornings where you get up, you're like, God, I don't feel like praying. But the moment that you get on your knees and you begin to pray to God, the moment you begin to sing praises unto him, you start to feel his presence usher in. You got to be intentional about your relationship with God. Look at this picture. It's like a fire. And to kindle a lasting fire, what do you have to do? You got to keep putting wood. Something to fuel the fire. You keep putting wood. And in our relationship with God, we have to kindle to make that fire last. And it's going to take intentional effort. What does this include? It means spending time with God. It means listening to God. It means reading what God has written to you. It means speaking to God. It means thinking of God in unoccupied moments. Say that with me, unoccupied moments. What does that mean? When you're not distracted with anything else, but it's just you and God. In the same way with your spouse, in the same way with your children, you know, the one thing that that I, I, I wouldn't trade for the world is time with the people that I love the most. Because you... You can't get that back. So every opportunity that I get to spend time with my kids, I'd rather do that. You know, instead of doing other things, I'd rather spend time with my family. Why? Because as the years go by, you notice that they grow and pretty soon you blink your eyes and your kids are in college. You blink your eyes and your kids are married. You blink your eyes, your kids have kids. You blink your eyes, you're on your deathbed. It goes too fast. You got to enjoy the moment. You got to live for today. And I know there's opportunities where you you want to do things for yourself, but you got to realize, hey, the time that I lose is time I can never get back. All of us started with a bank full of time. But as our life goes on, that thing is dwindling. And the thing is, you can't add to it. It just keeps dwindling and it all matters how you spend it. It's going to get spent. 
But are you going to spend it wisely with the people that you love? And most importantly, are you going to spend it with God? So also this would include adoring God. It also speaks, it's also about speaking of God to others and sharing his love. And lastly, giving to God and making glad sacrifices to him. Doing things that make God happy. Whether it's blessing someone that is hurting or someone that's in need. Those are all forms of worship and those are all forms of kindling that relationship with God. You know, our present culture often thinks of love as something that happens to people. They think that just love just magically happens to you, right? The movies you watch, it's like love just happens. Love just doesn't happen. It's not something uh, that just happens out of the ordinary, but it's something that is chosen. Again, you choose to love someone. You choose to pursue someone. Take, take it back in the day when you were in school and, and you had a crush, maybe in the classroom, and you're so excited just to sit next to the person you have a crush next to. I remember in sixth grade, I remember in sixth grade I had a, I had a girlfriend, and uh, this is how I asked her. I said, hey, do you want to go around? You know what going around meant? Holding hands and walking around the playground. And do you want to go around? And then we broke up three months later, you know. But that's, that's not love, right? The world thinks love just happens to you, but love is chosen. And the phrase, because he set his love upon me, reminds us that a significant aspect of love is indeed a choice. Look, God gave us everything. Amen? And I mean everything. Everything that you could think of. Your health, your job, your family, your friends. He gave you everything. Because if God would take everything back that he gave you, you would be nothing. You would be just blank space. Nothing. But everything you have is dependent on him. Name one thing that you have that is not from God. Can anyone think of anything? You could probably think of the negative stuff. That's not from God. Sin's not from God. But everything that's good in your life, name one thing that is not from God. And it hits us and amazes us that we're fully dependent on him without even realizing at times. And the least that we can do is give him back what he deserves, amen, to give our lives as a living sacrifice. He died for me, so I will live for him. Say that with me. He died for me, so I will live for him. And just as you should schedule time with people you love, how much more should we schedule time with God? That's why it's so important to be at church. You know, God gave us the opportunity to be surrounded by a family of faith, which is so vital in our lives. We learned that when we talked about the Solidify series, right, about finding your family of faith, how it's so important to be, to have a support group. But it's so important to be in the presence of God because there's areas in your life that need to be chipped away at. And if you don't go in the presence of God, you get hardened and hardened the more weeks go by without attending church, without being in the presence of fellow believers, without being in the presence of God. And when you receive the word of God, that transforms you. But if you skip out, you know, a few weeks in a row, you feel like you start to just slip. You start to feel like you're, you get cold from God. You start to feel like you're slipping away. You feel like your fire is starting to die out, right? You feel like that coal you know, when you're together with a bunch of different coals, you stay hot. But you feel like that coal, when you're on the other side, you grow cold and you die out because you're not with the rest. That's why it's so important to be part of a church family and to be in the presence of God. So you've got to schedule that time. Make an effort to come to church. Make an effort to, to attend the activities. You know, it's fun. I don't know who says Christian life is boring because I tell you, I'm having fun in my life. Amen. How many of you having fun at the Cornerstone? I'm having fun. Can I get amen? amen? Then it says, so we were talking about set your love upon him. There was a story of a father who loved his son, and his son loved his father. And he was across the room, and uh, he said, son, come, come here. I have something to give you. And the son's like, what, dad? What? He's like, son, come over here. I have something to give you. He's like, I, dad, I can't hear you. Well, how, come you how come you're whispering to me? And he kept going closer. He said, son, come here. I got something to give you. Something to give you. He's like, Dad, I can't, I can't hear you. So just take a step closer. Son, come here. I have something to give you. You're going to love it. It's so awesome. Dad, I can't hear you. What is it? And he finally got so close to his dad. And he said, Dad, why are you whispering? Dad, 
And the dad said, son, so that you would come close. And sometimes God whispers in our lives, and you're like, God, what? Well, what is that God? And you're like, I can't hear you clearly, but I know you're talking to me, but I can't hear you because there's too much noise in my life right now. I'm hanging out with the wrong people right now. I'm, I'm in the wrong places right now. I'm in the wrong mindset, the wrong thoughts. And God says, son, daughter, come here, come here. And he pulls you and draws you away from the noise. And you say, okay, God, why, why are you whispering to me? And God says, because I want you to draw close. I want you to draw close to me. That's what it means to send your love upon him, to draw close to him. Then he says, therefore, so it's because he has set his love upon me, therefore, I will deliver him. The promises and principles stated previously in the psalm are repeated again. But this time, it's coming from the mouth of God himself. He's speaking directly in first person to you. He says, God will protect his beloved. He will set him on high because he has known my name. Look at that. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Do you truly know God? Or do you just know kind of who he is or do you know a little bit about him or do you truly know him you know with my wife I grow every single day even with the almost 16 years of marriage I just want to know get to know her more every day and if you put it on like a percentage wise you know it's just it should be climbing up you know 77 percent 78 percent 79 percent it should continue to grow and with God, we should continue to grow with, with him and know him. Do you know him? Do you know his name? Now, what does he say, do you know my name? Because it just doesn't just mean, do you know what I'm described as or what my name is. You know, like us, oh, I know your name is uh, Caleb. I know your name is Walter. I know your name. But how different a name is when you truly know the person. Amen. Like when I say, oh, you, do, you know, do you know Herb? I know Herb. Yes, I know Herb. He's my, he's my brother in Christ. I know him. He goes, he goes to my church. He's like a family, family member to me. And then, oh, okay, because he, he's my coworker. See, they, they might know him on this level, but then I know him on a, a more deeper level, amen? So his name is more special to me, Right? Oh, do you, do, you, do you know this guy named Merv who works at Comcast? Yes, I know Merv. He's like a brother to me. I love that guy. Oh, yeah, because I went to, go, I went to school with him. I, I saw him on your Facebook. Yeah, you know, we're close. See, there's a difference of how he knows him and then how I know him. There's people in your life that are very close to you. Their name is special to you because you know who they are. God says here, because they've known my name, because you know my name, I'm going to set you on high because you know my name. Can I get an amen? Do you know God? Do you know him? When he says, I will set him on high, he says, I will place him on high so he's out of the reach of the enemy. God will set you on high where all the, the wild animals or ravenous animals are trying to get at you. But God places you on high so they can't touch you because you know his name. I love this quote. It says, there are blessings that some believers miss out on simply because they are always fretting and do not trust God as they should. You know, every time you doubt God, you're missing out on blessings. But every time you say, God, I'm going to put my foot down and I'm going to trust you. When, you. when you say, God, I'm going to trust you, God just starts to flood blessings your way. You want God to break through in your life? You want God to break through in your situations? Don't doubt him. Trust him. Because the more you doubt him, the more he has to withhold that blessing because you ain't ready to receive it. But when you trust him, God begins to meet your need. So there's some blessings that some believers miss out on because they don't fully trust God. And here the psalmist quotes God as saying that the blessings are for those who love God, who acknowledge his name, for those who call upon him, and for those that seek satisfaction in him. And then it says, I will be with him. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. In verse 15, and I will be with him in trouble. What does it mean I will be with him in trouble? Look, 
In the last lines of the psalm, God spoke personally to you. And this is what he promises. Look, what, look in, this, in the verses that we've read already. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. I will honor him. Even the last two verses where we're going to get to, the last verse says, with long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. How wonderful are the promises of God. First, he promises you his presence. Not just presence, but his presence. He says, I will be with him in trouble. He promises that. Second, he promises the blessing of protection. I will deliver him. Third, he promises the blessing of his promotion. I will honor him. Then he promises the blessing of prosperity. With long life, I will satisfy him. And lastly, he promises the blessing of preservation. And I will show him my salvation. I'm going to read this, these verses again. And I want you to see how it all fits in. And I want you to listen to him speaking to you directly this morning. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And the last word says, I will be with him in his trouble. I just want to break that down and close with that this morning. How fitting is this, especially it being Mother's Day? Now, granted, you know, maybe some of us uh, didn't have the type of mother that we would always dream of. But maybe there was someone in your life that took on a motherly figure role. You know, maybe you had an aunt or maybe a grandma or someone that's very dear to you that you can call like a motherly figure. And others, you know, have mothers that have been there for them, you know, through the thick and thin. From the moment you open your eyes, you know, your mom was there. And how fitting is it that just like moms, and I, I really believe that moms have a special ability that they, that they were given by God. A special characteristic that God placed in them that only moms have. Many mothers, many of the precious women I know who are moms that exemplify this trait, they're good and faithful moms. They're moms who won't leave your side. You know, they would be the one to, the last one standing there. When her children are sick, she'll be the last one there. Taking care of them. Mom would be the one up late, taking care of the needs of her family. She'd be the one packing lunches. She'd be the one doing the laundry. Mom would be the one who's the last to eat after making sure all her kids' food's cut up. <laughs> By the time she's done, her food's cold. Mom would be the last one left if you're at the hospital. Mom would be the first one there when you need her. Honestly, I don't know how you do it, moms. I honestly don't know how you do it. And well, without you moms, without women in the world that were godly, motherly figures, I don't know how this world would function. Because you fill a role that no one else can fill. And it's kind of corny, but when I see the word mom, if you took the word mommy and turned it upside down, <laughs> it's wow. <laughs> it's wow. I would be lost without you, mom. You know, I would be lost without, you know, my grandma. I'd be lost without the people in my life that have that characteristic of a mom. Even, you don't have to be my mom, but I, I know my, like my sister or, or my aunts, but they have that, that tenderness that, that moms give. But see, 
moms exemplify a trait that God displays to us, but even in a greater way. Again, God speaks and acts like a tender-hearted mother. And what I will never forget, what I will never forget, the first thing that pops up when I think of my mom is this. And you probably can agree if your mom was there. The moments I was sick, it's like one of the first things that pops in my mind. Whether I was running a fever or going through the flu, I remember my mom's hand. I remember the Vicks, put the Vicks on my chest. <laughs> remember that? Put the Vicks on my feet. Or maybe it was your grandma who did that, you know. I remember the towel on my head. And I see, I see my wife do the same thing. But one thing I know is that God says, I am even more tender towards you. I will never leave your side. I will watch you through the night. Just as a mom would sacrifice her own sleep, the good thing is God never sleeps. He watches you 24-7, seven, seven days a week. And God is like that in an infinite way. He'll never leave your side. And whatever you're going through, whatever challenges you're facing, listen. And I'm going to close with this. Listen. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, whatever challenges you are that it, that's staring you right in the face, if you set your love upon him, he reminds you, child, I got this. So, child, let your heart rest from the anxiety. Let your heart rest from the worry. Listen, I know anxiety is so rampant in our lives. Even I struggle with anxiety. Even I worry, right? You're like, what? You worry, Pastor? Yeah, there's times I worry. You might be worrying about your health. You might be worrying about, you know, your children or, you know, your finances or your job. Whatever it may be, it's, it's natural. But it's those moments where you push it back and say, God, I trust you. It's those moments you push that anxiety back and say, you know what, God? I declare that you got this. So this morning, with all his bowed down and eyes closed, Just lay down that anxiety this morning. Lay down that anxiety. Lay down the chaos in your heart and in your mind. Lay down the doubts. Lay down the worries. And just say, God, I trust you. Say, say that with me this morning. Say, God, I trust you. Lord, we honor you this morning. And we thank you for reassuring that you have our backs, that there is nothing impossible for you, that there is no obstacle too big that our God cannot handle. But God, it takes for us to set our love upon you. It takes for us to really trust you. And in that, we see your hand begin to move in our lives. And God, we don't want to hinder your work. We don't want to hinder the blessing from flowing. But today, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we say we love you, God. And we declare that God's got this. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a big clap offering. Hallelujah.